welcome to What the Duck, a podcast with real experts talking about direct spin challenges and experiences. And now, here's your host, Source Day's very own manufacturing maven, Sarah Scudder. Thank you for joining me for What the Duck, another supply chain podcast brought to you by Source Day. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and this is the podcast for people working in the direct materials part of supply chain. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S Scudder on Twitter. If you are new to the show, make sure to follow this podcast so you don't miss any of our direct materials supply chain content. Today, I'm going to be joined by Emily French, and we're going to discuss how to work with competitors to secure supply. And yes, you heard that correctly. If you work for a manufacturer struggling to order materials from original equipment manufacturers, also known as OEMs, who are overseas and were greatly impacted by COVID, then this episode is for you. Emily is an estimator for Shermco Industries in Irving, Texas. Shout out to Texas. I've been a Texas resident now about a year and a half. She started out as a temp to help with inventory cleanup and was not promised a position. Through hard work and dedication, she showed she wanted to work at Shermco. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thank you. So I am the oldest of four girls, and my second oldest sister, so the the the, the one under me is named Emily, and she is brilliant and by <laughs> far the smartest and most academic of the Scudder fam. So you have you have a good name. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Emily, you started your career as a buyer at Shermco. So talk to me a little bit about what you did as a buyer. Um, as a buyer, typically I would wait until our shop director sent over the parts request that we needed for the job that we were repairing, um, building. And then I would issue the purchase orders to each vendor for what we needed, whether it be materials or perhaps, um, an outside contractor that would repair um, any kind of maybe welding that needed to be done, or um, it's called milling, like milling feet. It flattens out the steel so that it's even when it sits on the platform. And what would you say when you were a buyer, what, what did you spend most of your time procuring? Um, A large part of what we get is going to be bearings. Um, They can go from a bearing that's the size of a ring that fits on your finger to one that's the size of a car. Um, Sometimes you have to get them from, there's a a Komatsu is a vendor that sells them and they are for, they're, they're huge. And so bearings and brushes, and it's not a brush that you think is like a hairbrush. It's actually a block of carbon. Um, it's referred to as a brush. It, it, that was definitely a, uh, a game changer for me because when they said, you, you know, we need to order these brushes and I'm thinking, what do we put brushes in, you know, a, a wind turbine? Yeah, no, for? I immediately would think hairbrush or, or hair like brush. makeup brush. Makeup brush, right. You don't think a block of carbon that's actually making contact with what's uh, called a slip ring and then it keeps the electricity moving through the unit so that you see those big fan blades moving at the wind farms. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's an eye opener. It's definitely different. So why did you decide to pivot from being a buyer to actually go into procurement? Um, I don't know if I actually decided that, um, it was kind of decided for me. I'm very good at solving problems. My, uh, my former boss, he says I'm a bulldog because I will go after it and I will find it. I'm determined. So they saw those, those skills and apparently it works really well in procurement. So why Shermco? One of the things that I love about you is, as you said, your nickname is a bulldog, but you seem like a real hustler and you found this company wanted to work there, you were hustling, not guaranteed a job, and you, you, you know, you really picked out this company for a reason. So would like to know why. So um, previously, I was a preschool teacher. And I had, I had a daughter on the way, my uh, 
my last and fourth child. And I just wasn't wanting to do little kids at home and at work. Um, so my best friend, who I actually ended up working for here at Shermco, she was like, I think you'd be a good fit. So she brought me on and it just went from there. I mean, it's you learn something new every day. Um, it's like a puzzle piece that you're trying to figure out what goes next. How can I get it? Um, I don't know. It's it, it keeps your mind moving. And I that's what I want. I don't want to just sit here and, you know, type at the computer all day. I like trying to find the solution. So what does Shermco do? I, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm in Texas, but I'm in Austin. So I, before us prepping and, and chatting for the show, I had not heard of the company before. So um, we repair electrical apparatuses. That's the fancy way to say it. Um, we have our electrical division. Then we have our machine shop division, which is where I work is for uh, the machine shop. And what we do is we will, we do in industrial and wind. Um, we basically, we have our, we have the wind farms that you see out in West Texas, right? Um, the generators that are in those turbines, our field service pulls them down with a crane. And of course, sometimes there's a delay in that with wind. Cause I mean, that's, that's hundreds of feet in the air. So we pull it down, they bring it to the shop we dismantle, we try to figure out what's wrong. It's not always the same thing. So it's not a cookie cutter shop. So, it, so it, you it, don't, you don't build them, you fix them. Yes. We repair them and then we maintenance them and then we take it back and we put it back up there and go to the next one. Interesting model. Um, so you must have, your your founders must have noticed a niche where people were creating them, but also didn't have the ability or interest to service them. From what I understand, Pete Sherman that actually founded the company, um, I think it was 1974. It was, it was actually airplane motors they were working on. And then, yeah, they, they saw a need and he stepped up and it boomed. Because now we're in Canada and all over the U.S. We help go set up new facilities. They did a, one a couple years ago in Africa. I mean, we're all over. Interesting. I'll have to. So I'm from California originally, just moved to Austin, end of October 2021. So I wonder if there's anything in the Bay Area, in California. Um, I know I buy parts from there, <laughs> but no, I don't know if we have an office out there per se, or even maybe a remote location, but, um, if we don't, I'm sure they're working on it. So one of the other, I, I always like to kind of follow people's career path to figure out how they landed to where they are today. One of the other promotions that you had was to become a product line specialist. So what is this? A lot of our listeners may not be familiar with this um, title. A uh, product line specialist is basically inside sales. Um, it's customer service. It's you reaching or reaching out to the customer if we've already got that relationship, seeing what needs to be done, what are their needs, will they have an outage coming up. Then we get that motor into the shop for repair. We follow along with getting it estimated, what needs to be fixed, what doesn't. Um, and then just communicating our lead times, quoting, giving them the price, and then staying with that motor until it's out the door for delivery. And anytime there's a bump in the road or anything, answer questions, just basically keeping that line of communication open between us and our customer. Uh -huh. Most important lesson you learned in that role where you were interacting and customer facing? Um, let's see. I, I learned that I've got to keep my boss calm so that we can keep the, keep everything smooth. So as long as he's happy, we're happy. As long as we keep in contact with that customer and keep him updated, we're good. Communication. I, I have some horror stories. When I moved into my house in Austin, I ordered furniture and most of it was delayed or didn't arrive because of COVID. And I was shocked at how poor the, most of the communication was, like literally not hearing from a supplier reaching out, no response. Rather have some communication, even if it's bad news versus nothing. 
Exactly. Exactly. So now you are what is called an MSD estimator. So what is this? MSD stands for Machine Services Division. Um, basically what I do is I will follow our jobs once they get into what we call estimating our parts pricing status. I will then pull our requested list of parts, see who we can get it from, who we can't get it from, see what our lead time is. Sometimes I will double check. I'll go out into the shop and I'll get right in the dirt and mess with the grease and get the parts to a fabricator if I have to get it made. Um, so basically, I'm just trying to get the best price, best lead time so we can get it to sales quote to get out to our customer. So what does a typical day look like for you? Like you, you, show, you get to the office and how do you structure your day? <laughs> I, I come in with a plan and the structure usually blows up in my face. Um, <laughs> it's, it's always something new every day. Um, but a typical day I'd come in, double check with who needs what, where we stand. Um, I'll go over the jobs that I'm working on, see where I'm at, see if I need to reach out to my vendor if I haven't gotten a response in a timely manner. Um, then I'll go to my team lead, see what we need for inventory. Uh, we'll get that on order. I um, I mean, I do a little bit of everything. Sometimes I'm having to help with the front desk if one of our girls are sick. I'll go back and forth with our payables department to make sure we get everything received in and ready to pay. Because, you know, got to pay those bills so we can keep our doors open. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's. It's nonstop, but I mean, it's fun. It keeps me busy. It keeps my brain moving. So I, I, I do enjoy it. I have my frustration from time to time. Who doesn't? But, um, but yeah, it's, a, uh, it's never a typical day because I can write it out because I've got a planner and every afternoon before I leave, I'm like, all right, I'm going to write this, 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 this is what I'm going to do. And I look at it and I'm like, there is no way I'm going to actually do it in that order. But I try to come in with a smile on my face and get it done. So how does being an estimator, uh, which is what you are now, differ from being a buyer? Um, being a buyer is more, everything's already laid out and I just have to get that purchase order, get that order confirmation, find out that ETA and follow it. Being the estimator, I've got to stay on these vendors because I've got one in Austria that I've been trying to go after for three weeks now. And I mean, I wish I could take the holidays these people take. They're they're always on holiday. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm lucky if I get two hours of time to myself in a week. So, uh, but yeah, estimating, you, you just really got to stay on top of the vendors to get the answers that you need because- So it, it sounds like an estimator is maybe a little bit more strategic and more supplier relationship management focused where you're going back and forth and following up and kind of working with the suppliers more. Yes. Yeah. I, I would definitely agree with that. So our show is is- focused on direct materials procurement. Most of our listeners work in manufacturing in some capacity. So I always like to find out about the direct materials challenges that our guests are experiencing. So what would you say is the greatest direct material challenge that you've had to overcome in the last six months or so? In the last six months, it yeah. would probably be our lubricants, our greases. Nobody has them. And you're lucky if you can possibly trade with a quote unquote competitor, uh, which we have done. Um, but we we were searching online one day because we were at our wit's end because we had to have this grease. We came across this little mom and pop lubrication website. Those people have been a godsend because they are literally the only place I can get these lubricants from even my bearing vendors don't have them. They're six, seven months out. I can't wait six, seven months. Well, why is there such a shortage? Um, the short answer and my favorite is supply chain issues. So <laughs> I hate that phrase at this point. Um, they're saying they just don't have the materials. And I, I guess 
these people that we found, nobody really knew about them, but now we've, you know, our entire company uses them now and, uh, they, they're perfect. I even have had to tell one of my bearing vendors once to say, Hey, you know, these people are your competition when it comes to that. So some of the materials that go into the lubricant is there, the, the, the manufacturers are having trouble getting, so they don't even have product to be able to produce enough to meet the demand. That that's how it is coming across. Yes. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about what you've done, and that's kind of the the topic for our conversation today, is that you've actually had this challenge getting lubricant and other things in the past and have actually gone to competitors to get products. So walk me through why you decided to do this and, and how somebody who's listening might be able to do this as well for for this, the things that they are not able to secure? Well, I mean, we're, we're all here to make money. We're all here to have a productive business. And the relationship with this particular vendor was actually already in place through the previous estimator that was here. And they had worked together for years. And I, I built a relationship with him as well. And there will be times that he reaches out to me because he needs a, a drive-in slinger that goes into the bearing compartment. And I'll have a manufactured, I'll ship it to him, and he'll pay it. I'll reach out to him and say, hey, I, I need this encoder like yesterday. Do you have it? Because apparently we're six months out. And because they... They're a, they're a bigger outfit than we are, so they have a bigger inventory, or I should say a larger inventory facility. So um, he'll sell it to me. I mean, like I said, we're all out here to have a business that's thriving. So we're, we're, no, you're we're actually, not trying. You're actually going to a direct competitor and saying, we need these things. Do you have them in inventory? Can I buy them from you? That's correct. I know it sounds crazy, but the relationships there. And so we use it. We both do. What about, so my mind immediately goes to, well, I don't necessarily want to have to contact and work with a competitor. Could I go and find alternative suppliers instead? Or could I work with my team and and find some sort of substitute material. So have you had any success going out and finding alternative suppliers for some of the things that you weren't able to get? Yes, we actually have. We, we don't always use our competitor. That's kind of a last resort. Um, but no, we have through different, through the different people that actually work here, everybody has so many contacts in this world. And it's kind of a, a niche business to be in because you, you don't see a whole, whole lot of people out there repairing wind generators. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of like word of mouth. We, we had a guy that uh, it was actually a customer that told us about a bearing probe vendor and we'd never used them before. But we started using them and they're always accurate, always on time delivery. Pricing is great. I mean they're even better than what you could if, if you ordered from the OEM. And I, I can only imagine because it's here and not overseas. Yeah. So you have had some luck finding alternative suppliers. So you're not solely dependent on supplier one or two suppliers for everything, which is, was what we all strive for, right? We want to have backup oh. and alternatives if Definitely. someone is not able to fulfill your order. I'm curious to kind of dive into your inventory strategy. So we had a pivot in the industry for people wanting just in time where they wanted almost no inventory and they wanted mm -hmm. things on demand. And now we've kind of gone through the reverse where people were buying massive amounts of inventory and have supplies for two or three years. So walk me through what your inventory strategy is. Well, we, so our sales, our outside sales representatives, they, they talk to these customers on a daily basis. They get a feel for if they're going to have an outage, if they're going to have four units down or 25 units down. 
And some of them will we'll know that we need a somewhere in between there. If we keep that in house, then we'll be prepared because say we've got an outage that's going to have 25 units coming down. They don't all come in at once. It's, you know, it's scheduled out two weeks between each one per se. Um, so we'll have enough to say we'll have 15 to do those units. So that time when we first get that first unit in, we can go ahead and put in for the 10, the next 10 units that we're expecting. That way we don't have too much, too little, because your lead times are going to be, you know, three to four weeks or heaven forbid, 12 to 16 weeks. Um, but you'll have enough time. We Luckily, we've had enough time to get that second shipment in. So then by the time we've used the first round, we're good to go with the second. And then during COVID, so I would say the last couple years, were you buying excess amounts of inventory and doing what I would consider stockpiling just to be safe? The first year we didn't because business did slow down. It seemed to slow down everywhere around the world, right? Um, there were certain items that we would stockpile on, not on everything, especially the items that we knew that it didn't matter if what time of year or when they had it, they did have a longer lead time just because of the intricacy to complete the product and get it out the door. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't everything we were stockpiling, just certain, certain very, very important parts. That's, that's the best way I can say it. Mm -hmm. And what is your, in an optimal situation now, when you order something for inventory, what's, what's a, a, a good turn time for you? About three to four weeks. Oh, so three it's to four weeks. Is, yeah. So you're turning, yeah, you're turning things really monthly. Bad. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Definitely. Well, thank you for discussing how to work with competitors to secure supply with me today, Emily. Where would you like to send people to find you? Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, of course, everybody has Facebook. I don't know if anybody really uses it anymore. That's more of an Instagram thing now. Um, but mainly I would say LinkedIn under Emily French. If you missed anything, you can check out the show notes. You can find us by typing in What the Duck, another supply chain podcast in Google. To have the optimal search results, make sure to add another supply chain podcast at the end of your search. To ensure you don't miss a single episode, make sure to follow this podcast and subscribe to us on YouTube. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S. Scudder on Twitter. This brings us to the end of another episode of What the Duck, another supply chain podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and we'll be back next week.